Joshua chapter number 6. Joshua's journey. As you remember, the first chapter of Joshua, God speaks to Joshua and tells him that Moses is gone. Moses is dead. And now he would take up the responsibility of leading the children of Israel. He would be the tip of the spear if you will, as they marched into the land of Canaan and began taking the, this portion of real estate of which God promised them. In Joshua chapter 6, they come to Jericho. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall uh, compass the city, all ye men of war, and go up about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. And seven the priest shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn, and the seventh day that it shall ye shall compass the city seven times and the priest shall blow with the trumpets and it shall come to pass that when ye make a long blast with the ram's horn and when ye hear the voice of the trumpet and all the people shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and <clears throat> excuse me and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Our Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for this time as we honor our veterans who have served our country. And Lord, thank you for <coughs> their patriotism and their love for our nation. We now ask that your, for your guidance and your direction as we present these, uh, this message this morning that Christ be exalted and forgive me for Christ's sake I pray. Amen. The children of Israel crossed the Jordan. And you remember that the Jordan had swollen its banks at this time. Uh, somewhere around the width of this building would have been the height of the water at the time. But they cross on dry ground, didn't they? Now that's the same thing they did the river of Egypt, wasn't it? Cross, cross on dry ground. In this case, it was when the priest's feet touched the water. Now what do you think? Would you like to be on the front row of the priest as you're heading for that water for you? And it would be your foot that touched the water and the water divided, didn't it? Gilgal is where they stopped. Remember how they were supposed to pick a stone up out of the middle of the water or the riverbed, pick up a stone? And they went to Gilgal and they set up these stones in front of the tribe's banners. There were four banners and three uh, tribes of Israel fit in each one. But they mounted those stones and then they headed for Jericho. When they got to Jericho, word had already reached them happened at the Jordan. So they shut the city up. Now besieging the city was a common practice in those days because you couldn't go over the walls. The walls of the city were the city's protection. Now Jericho had two sets of walls which was unusual and over here you see the entry now the reason this was made this way if the enemy would break in through the first gate there would be a killing field right there on both sides here and here and that small narrow passage to get into the city and so it was their way, a further example of how they were to defend the city. And, um, but you, you see the walls, and the walls, 
is that, what's the next picture? The walls were six feet thick, mud brick wall, about 20 to 26 feet high. Okay? And then the, the lower wall was about 46 feet high, and the upper wall, somewhere around 12 to 15 feet, somewhere in that neighborhood. But the point was that there was a, uh, a tall for a wet wall here before the, before the army could not even get in the first place. And then there was a second one if they had breached the first one. In the middle there, in that lower area, was where Rahab had her house. And we'll talk about that directly. So that was a pretty good defense against any army. Uh, the city of Babylon, her walls were between 10 and 12 feet wide. Uh, uh, horses, two abreast, could go across the top of the wall. So these walls were very important. No way they could have gotten over those walls. So for Babylon's sake, they built a uh, waterway. They built a, a a uh, ditch around the city and diverted the water and went up underneath the, th the gates or the wiring and went up underneath and that's how they took Babylon. They went and opened the gates and they went in. But besieging a city would last up to two, three years. No one in, no one out, no food, no water. Jericho was quite a city to take. This picture, you know me and my pictures, this picture is from Jericho, and here are some pictures of the wall. Doesn't look like it, but there's pictures of the wall. This is ground level, and there's the wall. The scripture says it went down flat, correct? It did not fall out. It did not fall in. So the only place it could go was straight down. Okay? And that is a picture of the walls of Jericho. Part of the walls of Jericho. It went straight down into the ground. And the children of Israel walked over top of it. Now today, this is part of the picture. Today, this is the ancient city of Jericho right here. And there's the modern city of Jericho behind it. Okay? And uh, you remember that God said you are not to take anything from that city. Okay? Uh, you've heard me in the past talk about all first things belong to God. Firstborn son, firstlings of the flock, first of the crops, things belong to God. Do we not teach that in our giving that we give to God first and take care of everything else after that? Okay? All first things belong to God. And so Jericho was to be left. Uh, no, nothing was to be taken from the city of Jericho. I'd like you to notice, first of all, the victory was God-given. In verse number 1, excuse me, in verse number 2 of this chapter, and the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the men of I have given you. It was a foregone conclusion that the city would fall to the children of Israel. You know, God's promises are not contingent upon what happens or what we do. God's promises are contingent upon what He says. And when He said, I'm going to give you this, then it was already, you know, they already won the victory, didn't they? So what was left to do? What was left to do was for God to show them His power. Isn't that exactly what happened in Egypt? When they left Egypt, they did not band a bunch of men together for an army and fight against Egypt. They just stood back and watched what God did. And when it was time to leave, 
They followed Moses into the desert, and for the next 40 years, God would provide for them a... Uh, am I on? It's on. It's, okay. God would provide for them meat... Okay, my back. All right. Well, at least my voice is back. I don't know how my brain is, but anyway. All right. But he would provide for them everything they needed. It is true when they got to the promised land, they began reasoning among themselves, saying, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? So all they do, they sent spies, correct? Correct. Spies came back, oh my lands, this is bad. We're like grasshoppers in front of them. A couple of those spies, however, said, God promised it, let's go. You know, that's good advice for us today, isn't it? If God promised it, what are we waiting for? Okay? What are we waiting for? Finally, after they were turned back and came again, and that generation had passed on, now they come to Jericho, and now, now, I have given you this city, its king and its army. It's already done. Okay? I tell you, we serve a God of victory, don't we? Not a God of defeat. Do you know when God is defeated? is when his children do not trust his promises. When his children do not latch on to what God said, believing that what he promised, he will do. And that's the problem today, isn't it? With many churches, they look at what they look around them, they see all of that's around them, and we're prone to say, oh my goodness, we're in such a shape. Look at the world, look at the condition of everything. Well, you know, I don't find in Scripture where God's promises is contingent upon what the world is doing. I see in Scripture God saying, I want you to do this, I will be with you, I will help you, I will guide you, and you will have the victory if you trust me. That's what I find in Scripture. But of course, as with all things with God, God's it was well planned. It was well planned. You know, the men did not get together and say, now, hey, listen, let's open this drawing of the city and let's Let's, you know, you go here and you go here and you go here and we'll work this out to make sure that this works. God didn't do any of that, did He? What did He tell Him to do? I want you to march around the city once a day for six days. Alright? Now, wouldn't you think that's a little bit crazy? You know what? We serve a God of crazy. Because what we think should be a certain way, God says, no, 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 no. This is how I want you to do it. And it never fits within the framework of our understanding. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and your thoughts, and my ways your ways. God doesn't think like we do, aren't you glad? Okay? I heard a man say one time, I think God ought to do this in this particular situation. Well, I've said, I'm glad he doesn't think like you do. We ought, we'd be in a terrible mess. But God thinks on his own terms, in his own way. And he turns down to us and he says, now listen, I have made these promises. Israel, you're going to inherit this land. This is your land. Okay? Okay? And Joshua is going to be the tip of the spear to go in and lead you to victory after victory after victory if you will watch what you're doing and stay faithful to me. Well, Joshua, as you remember, march around six days once a day. On the seventh, I want you to march around seven times, blow the trumpet, and shout. And the, ver and the scripture says, and the wall shall go down flat. 
Isn't that crazy? Not right, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The Lord's not asking us to become great battle strategists. Not asking us to reason things out perfectly. You know, human reason put us into trouble. He says, you know, you just do what I say. Okay? It's much like being born again. It's not that we have to reason the thing out. The Lord tells us how to do it. And we have to believe. Isn't that simple enough? Believe. The message of the Gospel is not so profound and so deep that it's above anybody. The Bible was written in an 8th grade reading level. And it was designed to be the simple message of salvation, not the complex dealing of rituals. Just the simple message of salvation. That's God's plan. Alright? There was also a warning. You remember the warning? You're not to take anything. You're not to, uh, I mean, any, you're not to take anything. Nothing. Somebody did, chapter 7, didn't he? A Babylonian garment, and some silver, and he hid it in his tent. You know, nobody will see this. Nobody will know. God knew. So they leave Jericho and they go up to the next place called Ai, which is not far from there. And they even said, hey, we don't need to take a full force. We'll just take a few thousand men and this will be a done deal. This is, you know, look how easily Jericho fell. Ai should not be a problem. But they were beaten back, weren't they? The old expression is they come running back with their tail between their legs beaten and they started looking around what happened, what happened, what happened and that famous verse there was sin in the camp you need to find it heads of each clan come and down the line they went to the family and then they came to Achan and Achan had did this terrible thing now I showed you a picture of Jericho today. No one has built on the site of Jericho from this day till now. God said, I will, if whoever chooses to build on this site, I will take their first son when the gates go up and I'll take their youngest son when they finish. And that record right there, 1 Kings 16, shows you who did, who thought he could build there, and what happened to him. Okay? But God's warning was right, wasn't it? He told them, this is mine. This city belongs to me. And leave it. And it has been left even till today. It's never been built upon. No one's ever built it or done anything with it. And that's what those references there is about. Well, there was a situation with a woman by the name of Rahab. Rahab. The spies come up. She sheltered the spies, didn't she? She hid them upstairs, covered them, so the soldiers wouldn't find him, and then she helped him escape. Now here's a here's a question. You know, Bible students for a long time have asked the question: Where did Abraham's faith come from? And another question: What about this Rahab? In James, he's James calls her Rahab the harlot. Hebrews, she's mentioned as a woman of faith. Okay? 
Now go down a couple. One more. Right. Here. She was the spouse to Solomon who bore Boaz. And who did Boaz marry? Ruth. And she would be the great grandmother of who? Of David. I love it. Don't you love it when these people talk about racial purity? <laughs> I love it. God doesn't know one race from another. He puts all men under the same conditions and respects none over another. Because, and then David would come into this world and Naomi, like, Naomi got to watch those grandkids grow up. But that's Rahab. Back up one, please. You notice how I did that? I just raised my hand and that thing went back. Alright. Joshua gave orders. First thing. Now as I said, her house was built against the wall. Don't matter this, this drawing. But her house was built against the wall. On the outside. That second section of wall there would be for people of lower standard. Can I say it that way? Okay. okay. So, you put a scarlet uh, thread out, put a scarlet cloth out, and we'll come and find you. So her house, her and her house was spared because God delivered her and would use her to bring the greatest king that Israel would ever know and that is David. David would serve as king of Israel for 44 years and he is the most famous and David's son his second well I say David's son uh, but Solomon Solomon would be another great king that Israel would have. Okay? Now God could have delivered a lot of folk out of there, couldn't He? Why? Especially the kind of person she was. Why? God's not interested in where you've been. Not interested in where you are. He's interested in where you're going. Okay? He can change your life. He can change a person to the point to where their life begins to make sense. Right? You've heard me say that the condition of all people today, and we do, if we're not careful, we'll get wrapped up in that vein and think, oh my goodness, what are we doing? But listen to me. God has us here now for a reason. Okay? God has us here and now for a reason. And when the time comes, <laughs> He's going to call us out of here, isn't He? <laughs> he's going to deliver His people. And there's not a single thing the devil can do about it. But His deliverance the old song says his deliverance will come. Now, Israel's history is one of good and bad. They got a reputation pretty quick from all these victories and all the remember the remember the kings that got together of the Canaanites, they got together and they decided, we need to do something about this. We've got to stop this. They're just wiping people out, wiping one city after the next. How can we stop them? I know. We will have our girls and their boys and their girls and our boys get to know one another 
And what happened? Israel's effectiveness decreased, didn't it? And they started losing. What am I trying to say? Dear hearts, be careful. Be careful. The Lord's not interested in using a dirty dish. Be careful. Okay. Jericho is our first page in the land of Israel for a victory. What a marvelous victory it is. Now I did not go to Jericho. We went by it. I could see it out the bus window. So we went by it. But I was told as people stand there and look down inside, they have these paths. They want you to stay on. They don't want you wandering everywhere. Just imagine seeing a wall down the ground and knowing that God put it there. But I remind you that God can do anything. But He's not the God of defeat. He's the God of victory. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He conquered the devil and put him in his place and one day will put him in a pit and lock him away for a thousand years. That's the God that we serve. And out of all His sovereignty and out of all the greatness and out of the, under, the ability to listen to every prayer all over the world. He's never out of reach for you and for me. That He will pause and hear us. So that my question this morning. You ready for a victory? That victory being the victory over sin. The victory of knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. The victory of having a new life and the joy which it brings. That's the victory that Jesus offers. Let's stand together please.